Hello, boys and girls, and welcome to the Fearless Floyd Show. As always, I am your host, Fearless Floyd. Catch us on the fearlessfloydshow.com. We're on Telegram, Rumble, BitChute, YouTube, the Fearless Floyd Show. Cash App, Venmo, PayPal, the Fearless Floyd Show. Everything is the Fearless Floyd Show. Thank you for participating. <laughs> so while you're there, like, subscribe, share, read the description, leave a comment. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. And uh, we're going to dive into uh, part 14 and the floor on trusts. Absolutely. With and the floor. So. First, uh, let me see where I can go with this before I get Anne in the mix. And here we go. Share the screen. Sometime today. There we go. All right. This is the fearlessfloydshow.com. This is the homepage. It's where you're going to land. Right here, it tells you first thing, instructions. Go to the bottom for classes and consultations enrollment. So you can either scroll down. To the very, 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 very bottom. Where you can't go any further. And there's Ann's consultations. There's me. There's the B class that just uh, elapses very soon. There's Jesse. There's Dr. K. There's trust class C, which begins on the 22nd and passed through the way. Consultations. So basically, that's what you want to do. If you want to enroll in the next class, just click on that. Boom, it's going to pop up the 22nd. So that's when it starts. Click on that. Hit 12 p.m. Hit confirm. It's going to ask you questions. Actually, need to go in and work on that because there's not enough. I'll do that now that I see that. But anyway, that's how you do it. You just continue through those prompts and then you're registered. It's all automated. So anyway, I want to show you guys how to do that. Appreciate you. All right. I want to thank each and every one of you for participating. And I do got some uh, new news <clears throat> on the W4 process. Huh? I got that in the video coming up. All right. And with that, I'll be right back. The Animal Floor, Part 14 on Trust. And without further ado, Animal Floor. And here she is, just like I promised. Animal Floor. You're running too long. Hello again. Okay. We're ready to jump into Part 14 on Trust, Animal Floor. And getting interesting. <laughs> Here we go. Part 14. And trust. Today Part we're going to talk about commerce and how they use trust in commerce because we're talking about our private trust, but do we know how to intermix and millage them or mix them up with commerce? So today we're going to speak mostly on commerce and how commerce trusts work. All right, there you go. Part 14, panel two. So far, we've been talking about our private trusts and how they work. We now have a semi-good idea of how they work but we still have no idea how these corporate trusts work that we must deal with daily. These corporate trusts are loans, banks, courts, or whatever we work with in the public on a daily basis. It is a good idea to understand a little about how corporate trusts work and operate. 
See, every time we sign our name, we're signing into a trust and they're all out in the public. They're all corporations. And we just need to see how they're working because these corporate trusts work in the public. We're trying to work in the private. So now we've got to figure out how we can work in the private with all these wonderful public trusts. All right. And that panel was titled Understanding How Corporate Trusts Work. And with that, we're going to dive into panel three. Corporation trust. Corporate trusts are governed under statutes. These trusts are forever changing according to the political agendas and schemes they put into the statute or the laws they expect us to abide and live by. In corporate trusts, the board of directors are the managers of the trust with limited fine power to conduct the business of the corporation, hold regular meetings, and take care of the trust. These trusts have relatively broad powers. They can form holding companies, and they are not allowed to do what we can do lawfully. They can only do what is legal and are limited by the statute of the legislature. So remember, all these wonderful you know, statues, guidelines, all this junk that they throw upon us and say, we've got to live by these rules. Actually, they're mostly for the trust and these corporations. They pull us into it, but all this stuff that they're putting out there is the guidelines for these trusts. And they have to have a board of directors and the board of directors is their trustees. So these boards have to meet regularly, do what needs to be done, do their minutes, you know, talk to you about their stocks, their bonds, whatever they're doing and whatever they're offering you has to come through the board of directors. All right, panel four. The corporate officers are personally liable to the legislature and to the creditors for all their ambiguous endorsements. The lifespan of a corporate trust is perpetual or is limited in the number of years it can operate according to the legislative requirement. These trusts are required to report all the officers of the trust so the public can view who runs and operates these trusts. The corporate trust is obligated to obtain a business license. The trust is obligated to file statements and reports quarterly. Okay, so guys, we can always go in and see who the board of directors are for corporations because corporations are trusts. We can always see what their annual reports are or their quarterly reports. We have the, uh, we have the information right there in front of us. Now on private trusts, they can't see anything we're doing. We do not have to announce anything. We do not have to tell them who our trustees are, who are, you know, if we have more than one trustee, we have co-trustees, two, three co-trustees running our trust. Those are considered our board of directors. We're not obligated to tell anybody who they are. We have the privacy not to. But in corporations, because the legislator regulates the, the, the trust, so through the public and everything else, they have to. They have to report everything to us. Yes, they do. Panel five. Corporations are required to apply for a secure, fictitious firm name, and they must register all their trade names and trademarks. Corporate, that should be corporate. Corporate trusts are subject to federal excise tax in some states and they, and Subject states, they are, hang on, let me repeat that. Corporate trusts are subject to federal excise tax, and in some states, they are subject to state organization and franchise taxes. No matter what, all corporations are taxed indirectly via inflation. Yeah, we all are. Furthermore, corporations are inherently subject to all foreign corporation law and public policy regulations. The corporation is the 14th Amendment citizen, regardless of citizenship of the corporate officer. In most states, they require corporation officers to be citizens. They do. So basically, if you're running a corporation and you're the head of the corporation, you're in the board of trustees of the corporation, you have to become a 14th Amendment citizen. 
And if people really understood what the 14th Amendment citizen was, it is for anybody outside of the United States coming into the United States to declare their nationality or their new nationality or their new allegiance to the United States. So this is what they're asking people to do. So everybody keeps saying we're 14th Amendment citizens, but nobody is really honestly understanding a lot of these laws. And in trust, you are a natural person, especially when we go into the private. That puts us right back under the Fourth Amendment where we should be. We were never actually under the 14th Amendment unless we took an oath to be under it. So there's a lot of misunderstanding, misconceptions out there. And it's really good if people really start, you know, tearing this apart, reading it word for word and understanding who we are and what we have the power and possibilities to do with our lives. All right, moving on to panel six. As a corporate officer, you have relatively relative rights and privileges to do so and you can incur more taxability by not doing so. When corporations issue stocks, they must go public in order to offer these stocks. Stockholders have a relative say in the affairs pending on the extent of their holdings. A stockholder's right is protected by the court. However, the basic statutory nature of the corporation allows for the abuse. Stockholder, stockholders are generally at the mercy of someone else. Each share of stock is personal property in the hands of the owner. There are tax issues on the same property against you as owner and also the corporation. So we've been talking about our personal trust. We can issue our stock certificates through our personal trust. We can issue them to people to hold on to. We can issue them to, you know, pay fines and things like this. Corporations can't. Corporations can only issue public stock that goes on the stock market for trading. And when you buy that public stock from them, that you do have some say so, depending on how much of the stock you own through this corporation. But we are still in the public. We if we own the stocks and we sell them, we still have major you know, tax liabilities for it. In the private, we're not selling our stocks. We're using it as our collateral or we're using it like promissory notes. So we don't have the liabilities as we do in the public by purchasing public stocks. Okay. Panel seven. Corporations have a legal obligation to maintain capital and must pay dividends out of their capital. Corporations can only bring and defend litigations in the corporate name and the entity of the corporation. There is a process for piercing corporate veils and will succeed mostly due to the confusion of personal and official capacities by the officers. So remember, we don't have to deal with maintaining and paying dividends out of our stocks. I mean, out of our, out of our trust, excuse me, or paying dividends and whatever out of our stock certificates. Corporations have to. So you're gonna see all this stuff that corporations need to go through, all these ledgers, bookkeeping, everything else. But then if we look at it, how much of it's real? I mean, in any bookkeeping system, seriously, um, I'll be honest with you guys. When I first came here and I came back, you know, to the islands, or I never came to the islands before when I was young, but when I came back into the French territory, French territories, um, I did work for this, um, you know, setting up computers for this one company. And when they started having to pay Tavia tax here, he had two books. So which is real, which is not real. And it gets you to start thinking, wow, just a small little tiny company had two books to hide the fact because he didn't want to pay all his taxes. 
So how many books do corporations have that we don't know about? Just to, just putting it out there, just something to think about. That's it. Can't prove it, but it's something to think about. Oh yeah, even the prison system has two sets of books. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Panel eight, the beauty of express trusts. We're starting to see the beauty and benefits of express trusts. Express trust may engage in all manner of trade and commerce. It is so vital that you understand the nature of commerce and how it works and operates today. When the trustee is engaging in trade or commerce, and it is in behalf of the trust, the trust is acting under general common law. The trust is within the jurisdiction over which the literal and absolute protections of the Bill of Rights, the Bill of Rights, are extended. So we, as an express trust, our revocable living trust, our pass-through trust that passes from the private into the public, uh, or vice versa, the public into the private, we are protected under the Bill of Rights. These companies, these commercial companies and commercial trusts are not. So we have a larger opportunity to <clears throat> trade and work in commerce than they do. We don't have all the laws. We do have laws to follow. We do have to do whatever we're doing in honor with clean hands. So that is, you know, the stipulations. We have to follow the laws of equity. They have to follow the laws of statutes. <laughs> It's a big it's a big difference let me tell you it's a major difference hopefully <laughs> they will <laughs> okay panel nine when this happens it means that the trust has no direct contact with the federal government under the rights of contract law we are protected by the federal constitution any trustee may enter into the 14th amendment jurisdiction via contract you will willfully avail the trust of benefits like the quasi-corporate privileges black franchise of limited liability for the discharge of debt using federal reserve notes. This deals with the economic system that, is, that was established under former House Joint Resolution 192. This is contract discharge with payment of debts with standard gold back currency under the original coinage act 1792. Guys, let's get it through our heads. If we ever honestly read Congress's act of 1933, we would know that all they did with these federal reserve notes was give it a new name for gold. It is still backed by gold. There is nothing in the Constitution or anywhere else that will allow Congress to coinage money without some sort of backing. So Federal Reserve notes are actually backed by gold under the New Deal and whatever else they've done. It just, when they just renamed it, guys, um, there's like tons of stuff out there uh, how many gold things can you think about? I mean, literally think, how many things are named gold? Okay. You have gold plate. Solid gold. Gold medals. Metal plate. I mean, gold plated. I mean, there's hundreds of definitions for gold. Federal Reserve note is just another definition for gold. Read the contract. Read what they wrote. Read it carefully. Don't just skim through it and don't take other people's word for it. It's all there. And it does state so that these Federal Reserve notes are backed by gold and securities. So they have to have some type of securities in order to be able to print them and have them have us use them. It's the end of the story. There you go, panel 10. <clears throat> You realize that under the jurisdiction, the federal government or Congress has full and direct contact with the trust as they see fit. That, that should be contract, right? Direct contract? Or con mm -hmm. contract. Contract. It's a con trust or contractual contract. That's what I thought. 
They say it is for the benefit of public policy regulations, and it is reg regulated through statutes and codes of jurisdiction. This makes the federal government a third party intervener in the affairs of all trusts by the operation of law. So what is happening is that trust, just like the 14th Amendment citizen, that trust, uh, is being allowed to get away with the not truly get away with not truly fulfilling its commercial contracts as is required under the common law of contracts. That's it, guys. The federal government has stepped in and it's controlling the public trust, which are the corporations, which allow the corporations to not fill their contracts or their contractual obligations. Um, the federal government has a contractual obligation also. And it does with the printing of the money. It has a contractual obligation to use gold. Uh, trusts have a contractual obligation to their stock certificates. So a lot of manipulation and a lot of stuff is going on behind the scenes that we don't see. And it's basically all started right after, I would say 1945 is when most of the laws started changing really drastically. So uh, we just have to be careful. We just have to understand the laws, know the laws, know our rights and know how these corporations are working in the, the public and how we can benefit from them in the private. Yeah, that's what we want to do. All right. So we're moving on to panel 11. Under House Joint Resolution 192, the resulting nexus or confederacy developed is an affiliation known as an association. We see the common enterprise of this unincorporated society we are living in only offers all Americans a so-called privilege in the form of what is known as quasi-contracts. So we can participate in commerce without payment of debts for social security purposes. Under this unincorporated society that is outside the literal common law principles that loves to de demand us for the payment of debts, as stated in Article 1, Section 10, which is upheld and protected by Article 1, Section 10, that uphold the obligation of contract. Okay. What is great is that Congress cannot compel the trust or its trustee to participate in a federal inter interstate unincorporated banking association under Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2, and also under House Joint Resolution 182. All right, so before, before you even start, that's, that's a mouthful. So let me kind of go back over this just to, for clarification. We see the common enterprise of this unincorporated society we are living in only offers all Americans a so-called privilege in the form of what is known as quasi-contracts. So we can participate in commerce without payment of debts for social security purposes. So that sounds like the remedy. And under this unincorporated society that is outside the literal common law principles that loves to demand us for the payment of debts as stated in Article 1, Section 10, which is upheld and protected by Article 1, Section 10, that uphold the obligation of contracts. What is great is that Congress cannot compel the trust or its trustee to participate in a federal interstate unincorporated banking association under Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2, and also under HJR 192. Okay, I think I got that all out clearly. Okay, guys, you have to fully understand HR 192. People skim it, people read it, but if you actually start reading it, there will be questions in it, and you have to go back up to certain places, you have to go down, you have to find it here, you have to find it there. It's a, they do it on purpose. 
the way they write these, you know, orders, the way they write, you know, whatever they're doing, they write it in such a mess that even some of the congressmen are sitting there questioning it. And they're saying, okay, I'll support it if it's really this. And then whoever wrote it can make it look like it's something or something else. It's, it's pretty sick when you actually start digging into this stuff. And if you understand your amendments and your rights as a private, a private natural person, we do not have to go into that corporate ridiculous banking system that was and in inside there says no longer viable okay they're closed they're just keeping them open do you know why they're keeping them open to distribute and pass federal reserve notes so if that's the situation guys are you not the same as a bank do you not operate the same as a bank? Every time you go get a Federal Reserve note and you pass it from one person to another, you use it to pay with and you know receive and everything else. Are you not performing banking duties? Think about it. Are you not a banker? In their terms, you are. What they're saying in these contracts, you are. You're acting as your own private banker once you distribute these notes. Once you accept them, and pass them around, you're becoming your own private bankers. That's the way it goes. Right, you just don't know the rules and procedures of how to operate in the public and private realm. You're never educated. So you're getting educated now. Panel 12. <laughs> All corporations are in artificial creation of the state or federal government under physical charter or franchise issued via state or federal civil law for commercial regulations under Article 1, Section 8, Clauses 1 and 3. Corporations are not under the literal common law because they are charters or franchises. If we take any legal action against a corporation, it is legally called an NRAM action because it is, an, it is against the thing or property which is also the res of the corporation that is under the charter. In the courts, they have an automatic subject matter jurisdiction because the corporation or physical charter, and it is the subject matter. So guys, we're learning about res. What is a res and a trust? We don't name the price, we name the title. So we can't go against corporations, but we can go against titles. We can go against different things that they've done. There's a, it's so, you know, they've got this thing so ridiculously wrapped up between the federal government and all the new laws, regulations, clauses, whatever they want to put out there. And believe it or not, it is so hidden. And so much of it goes back to different banking acts, way back to different banking acts, and also goes way back to the different coinages of money. And it's so well hidden in all of their, their you know, laws and regulations. You, you literally, uh, they're not going to tell you. You literally have to dig through it. And a lot of it you can uncover. A lot of it will take you a while longer to dig and uncover. But it's all there. As long as you want to try to find it, you'll be able to find it. Then you're going to understand why we are in the situation we're in and why we need to literally get out of all of these you know so-called franchises and not even associate ourselves with them any longer and move into the private and start dealing all in private absolutely panel 13 corrupt banking oh my god what an accusation the banking... <laughs> i didn't do that did i <laughs> The banking system we know today is all about limited liability. They have learned that if they can get enough people to borrow money beyond their ability to pay it back, they could get them to keep performing or paying interest in one form or another on a debt, which is a liability, without ever demanding the principal back. Therefore, the banks keep loaning out of the same credit more than one person or company. 
guys, you know what? If you go in and you start reading these statutes and these laws, especially, you know, uh, look up 12 USC 412. Okay. These banks have to apply for their notes. Okay. They have to apply for them. So what does that mean? They have to come up with their securities or their promissory notes or their certificates or whatever they're going to get to get these notes. So they're sitting there and they're, they're taking their notes, but in the end, they do have an interest to pay back. So they don't want to pay that interest back. So they get us in these ridiculous loans that we have astronomical amounts of interest. And believe it or not, there is laws that state that banks cannot charge interest and stuff like this. Just find them. They're, they're, they've broken so many of these laws and we're just in the habit of doing it. And they have made it so easy for every person to get so much credit. Yeah, oh, my credit score. Oh, my credit rating. People rely on that so much. Uh, literally, honestly, I don't care about it. And I don't care about their credit. And I don't care about whatever they have to offer. I would rather work on a cash basis. Pay me for what I do. I'll perform my job and I'll move on. And sooner or later, we are going to be able to get rid of the system. And it's coming. Guys, it is coming. Just look around you. Look at banks around the world closing down. Look at the Vatican demanding central banks return their money. Look at all the things that are happening. The economy around us is crumbling. Are we ready for it? Fourteen. As long as we continue to perform and paying the interest, the banks are never fully responsible for the debt. This now makes real money or the gold become credit or what is paper money by loaning it to more than one person. Being involved in this type of commerce, it is called private commerce. This allows the churches to control the wealth and has allowed this type of private commerce to become standard practice around the world and is used as trade upon the sea or private international or admiralty maritime law. Guys, how do you think banks learned it? They learned it from the churches. The churches set it up. The churches were in control of it all. And if you look at it today, there's three entities that control everything. The churches control the wealth. The, um, the uh, London city controls the courts. And DC controls the military. Those are your three strongholds, guys. They control it all. So as we know, it's the churches who set up the banking. So we're looking at the way they did it. So you go all the way back in history and you see how these churches manipulated money. And then they set it all up and we fell right into it because that's what we were taught in school. We were brainwashed to understand these you know, situations. We were told, wow, it's good to borrow money. And wow, it's good to take things on credit. Wow, it's good not to have any money to pay it back because then we can take it away from you. And then we can sell it again to some other poor fool who will continue to pay the interest for us so we never have to pay our debts. And so we are just the debt payers of the banks. Absolutely. Panel 15, it is important to understand how corporations and commerce operates so we can interact with them from the private on the public side. As a trustee of a trust, we must understand all there is to know about corporations, the banking and how the laws regard, how the law regards these enterprises. We are responsible for the trust protecting the trust and protecting and investing the assets of the trust. If we do not have a good understanding of corporate trust, commerce, and banking, 
it will be harder for us to understand how our trust can protect us in the private and how we can run the trust with honor and protect the assets of the trust. So guys, one of the biggest things is everything is banking. Everything comes back to the church, back to the banking. So every transaction we do, everything we sign, everything we are involved in, all goes right back to commerce and banking. So it's really understand really important super important for you guys to understand banking laws and how banks operate and how if you're out there in the public that public bank account you have is so taxable and so accessible that banks can literally just tap into that account and they say oh every month you owe a service charge what are you doing for me why are you taking that Oh my goodness, you overdrew. Oh, there's $25. Oh, you didn't pay it back within two hours. Oh, there's another $25. Oh, you didn't pay it back the next day. Oh, there's another $25. Next thing you know, $1 or $2 overdraft has come up to be three or $400 bank charges. This is how bad they are. You guys move your accounts into the private, move them into your trust, don't allow the banks to touch your money anymore. Take care of it yourself. You don't need them. Your bank, you can run your bank accounts in the private from your trust. I'll get that. All right. Last but not least, panel 16. Private versus corporate. We are starting to get a better understanding of how trusts operate, why it is so important to have a trust to protect us, our assets, and to assist us in the public. Corporations have been operating under trust since the day they opened. Banks are controlled by the churches and fall under limited liabilities. Understanding all the functions of a private trust, public corporate trust, and our banking system will help us in our daily duties of running our own trust. It's not that difficult, guys. There's just a few things you have to wrap your heads around. There's a few things that you need to study to get a great idea of what's happening. And the first thing is, what is your trust? How can you use your trust? What is the first trust you need to create for yourself? You, Everybody seems to think that, oh, we need our revocable our revocable trust, irrevocable trust, or do we need our revocable trust? Everybody, there's a lot of people who start off with the irrevocable trust. They lock everything up into that irrevocable trust and they think they're safe. Yes, they're safe with certain things, but you're still using the public banking system, guys. You need a pass-through trust. You need to get that set up first. That to me is the most important trust to set up is a way to move money from the public into the private and use the private money that we have to get the things we need in the public. It's a pass through account. So instead of worrying so much about the irrevocable trust, start getting into understanding the revocable trust, understanding how they operate, how we can set them up. Because once we get that irrevocable trust done, I mean, the revocable trust, excuse me, the revocable trust done, we can literally move some of our assets into the irrevocable trust. We can move property into the irrevocable trust. It's passed through. We can create other trusts. We can do a lot of things, but we need the first one set up. We need the pass through, the gateway, the roadway, however you want to call it. We need that there. There you go. And that concludes part 14 and the floor on trusts. Boom. All right. Anything else to add, Ann? No, we just, you know, we have to understand com commerce. And commerce is so ridiculously, I mean, it's not that difficult, but they've got it so, so screwed up people can't wrap their heads around it. Uh, we just need to break it down into little sections for people to understand it. And actually the trust is a great way to do it. 
you know, getting your revocable trust set up, getting your bank accounts associated with it, getting a checking account and on your check that says trust, it says trust on it. Writing your checks that say trust on it to a company. Because when companies see the word trust on a check, they know the money inside that check is secured through your trust. Now, if you write the same amount of check on a public banking system and it's a very large check, they might question that check. Huh. Now, I got a question. Yeah. Absolutely. It's good to have your trust, guys. It's good to have your banking system set up through your trust. It's good if you're working. Everybody's still working. It's good to take that paycheck in the public and dump it into the private and use the private money to pay your monthly bills and to run your life. And you can fund your trust. That's what it's all about. It's a gateway. So you still can put a lot, all kinds of money in that trust. You can use that trust to, you know, contract to get a new car and for the trust. You can move the car into the trust. You can do what everybody does once the car's in the trust. Get your DOT, Department of Transportation dot numbers. Uh, once you have that, it's also associated with your trust. So you need a trust to get a dot. Once you get a dot, you get a plate. And once you get a plate, you're private. So it all coincides and it works beautifully together. According to Anne. <laughs> <laughs> the world according to Anne. There you go, kids. Okay. It's not just according to me. It's according to trust. <laughs> Accidents never happened in a perfect world. There you go. Okay. Well, there is car accidents because some people don't pay attention. Uh, things do happen, you guys. I'm not saying it's the perfect world, but I'm saying what? it's a better place to be. A better place to be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Welcome to Small Does this Talks. sound wonderful? <laughs> I'd rather be in the world of trust than the world of commerce. <laughs> oh my God. We're not we're not perfect, but we're the best you're gonna get. Okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean I mean when I was growing up, my grandmother used to say, Don't worry about being perfect because there was only one perfect person and they killed him. And I used to just look at her and go, wow, that's um, something to live by, isn't it, Graham? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's pretty crazy. All right. Yeah. Uh, I've got an, I've got a uh, letter from Treasury Retail Securities Services. I'm going to do a video on. This is part of the Debbie wow. Sports Sandwich stuff. Yippee. Yeah, there's a lot of people who are saying the W4 sandwich stuff is not working. There's so much to put in and there's not a lot of stuff coming out of it. I don't know. I never tried it. Uh, all I know is I did it. This is one of the results. So I said I'd make a video about it. I'm going to. It'd be interesting to see if they actually send you some money that you can put in your trust. <laughs> Oh no! You put it that. back in the public. They're, they're not going to take it away anymore. from you again. <laughs> no. No. Send me. You haven't decided to give you anything. No. Nothing's for free. Oh. That reminds me of songs they used to sing in the seventies. You know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Only Life and nothing is for free. <laughs> Only a CD for free. For free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> All right, Ann. Well, let me get going. Uh, I'm going to hit you up here. Okay, wall. sounds wonderful. Thanks uh, for inviting me back. I yes. hope you had a good laugh. <laughs> I did.
All right, kids, everybody <laughs> wave bye bye to Ann. We'll see her on part Hare, Hari Maru, Hari Tatsu. Take it slow, take it easy. Bye bye, everyone. <laughs> there she goes. And with that, Ann's gone. Amazing, huh? <laughs> so, uh, like, subscribe, notification, leave a comment below, read the descriptions below, share the video, The Fearless Floyd Show at yahoo.com, thefearlessfloydshow.com. I'm on Telegram, BitChute, Rumble, YouTube, Venmo, PayPal. Cash out, The Fearless Flood Show. Thank you for watching the video, part 14, and the floor on trusts. And we'll catch you back on part 15. But I'm going to do a video right after this and send it up. All right. Have a great day. Thank you for watching. Appreciate you.